I think we're just about ready to begin. Hi, Mark. Hey, Dali. Hey, Minta. Hey, okay, Craig. Can you hear me? Uh, I just wanted to confirm if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. I can hear you perfectly. All right. Minta. Hi, Craig. Hi, you. It's below. Okay. Yeah, it's that's a, pretty, that's a, that's a pretty pretty How are you? Clear, that's a remarkably yeah. clear Kakuma connection. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I believe that we're live and I'd like to uh, welcome our Facebook live as well. Okay, we'll... Uh, uh, we'll begin. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, All Out um, Undistanced Festival. Uh, it's an outstanding series um, of free virtual events during June and July that allow all of us to celebrate who we are across borders and, uh, and all you know, cultures. And it's given us a tremendous platform and I'm grateful to All Out and the All Out team for organizing such an, a meticulous uh, festival that uh, you know, has brought all of us globally together through this uh, you know, virtual you know, uh, process. Um, I'd like to welcome our panelists today. Uh, it's an honor to share this forum with, uh, with each of you, with uh, Dali Wow, who is uh, in Nairobi and uh, is uh, Deputy Director of uh, the Refugee Coalition of East Africa, REFSIA, and uh, one of the founding uh, members of the Foundation for LBQ Women, um, FLBQR in Nairobi, uh, Minta, Kabazi, who is uh, joining us live from Kakuma, uh, who's been involved in uh, some of the Refsia initiatives at Kakuma. Uh, it's an honor to have you joining us today as well, Minta. And Thank Craig my. Harris, who is the executive director of the Refugee Coalition of East Africa, uh, based in, uh, in Nairobi, but working um, across the entire country and, and, and other areas of East Africa, because I know because I've worked together with you on issues outside of Kenya, uh, that you're also called upon, um, you know, quite often to, to address. And um, so I, I, I'd like to, you know, um, invite you each to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, who you are and, uh, you know, what brought you to Kenya and uh, when you arrived and, and uh, um, you know, the, the beginning to this journey for you. So why don't we begin, we'll begin with, uh, with Dali. Dali, can you hear me? Greg, can you hear me? I can't hear I you. I can Greg. hear you, Mark. Uh, Dali, can you hear me? I think Dali might be muted. I don't think that so she can hear me. Minta, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You can. Um, why don't we begin with, uh, did you hear the question that I was directing toward Dali? Oh, can you please rephrase it? Could you rephrase it? And I yeah. didn't hear the last bit of it. My question was, uh, uh, began with first for you to begin introducing yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about what brought you to Kenya uh, and, and when it was that you arrived and how long you've been in, uh, in the refugee program in, uh, in Kenya. Okay. Uh, should, so should I shoot first? First, when, or why don't you tell us why you came to Kenya? Oh, well, uh, let me start by uh, introducing myself. My name is uh, Minta Kombaizi. 
a Ugandan and um, I'm a lesbian. Well, basically the main reason as to why I came to Kenya or flee to Kenya was because um, I wasn't able to stay back in my country of origin due to my sexual orientation and I wasn't welcome, uh, which I will not really get into details to narrate exactly what really happened, but I just wasn't able to be there anyone I wasn't safe. So I felt it right to come to Kenya, being that it was the nearest place that I could get to. And when was that? When? How long ago did you arrive? Uh, well, I've been here since uh, February last year. That is the time that I came in. Uh, do I need to really specify the date, Mark? Did you, did you go um, directly to Kakuma or did you go to Nairobi first? Uh, no, I didn't directly come to Kakuma. I first uh, stayed in Nairobi for quite some time before I was able to travel to Kakuma. However, I've been uh, in Kakuma for the past um, six months now. Yeah, but so, my first destination was Nairobi. So when you first uh, arrived in Nairobi, did you find um, community support? Did you find... Uh, uh, a refugee community and LGBT refugee community there to embrace your arrival? No, uh, my first arrival in Kakuma was, um, sorry, my first arrival in Nairobi was really challenging. Reason being, you know how you just can get into a place and it's a new environment, a total new environment, new people, and uh, you're not really able to associate so well. And besides the fears that you, really, that you come with, um, I wasn't able to really uh, get into connection with the LGBT community and uh, settling in was really a hard thing for me. But eventually I was able to get in touch with a few people here and there. And that is how I got introduced to di uh, different groups of people. That's how I got introduced to Repsia. And that is how it has been since then. Uh, Dali? Why don't you tell us um, a little bit about yourself and just uh, briefly when you arrived. Hi, I'm Dali Wao, a queer non-binary refugee from Uganda. I, I came to Kenya in 2017. And uh, I came to Kenya because it was actually the nearest and the farthest I could get from home. Uh, I, I left home because uh, I, I felt like uh, I couldn't be there anymore because the government itself was against me as a person because of my sexuality. And the people around me from the schools I attended to the family where I was born. So when I was, uh, when I was an adult, I was like, I, I just can't be here. And for me, I did it to mostly protect the people I loved because as a person, I had grown to accept who I was. But then my siblings and my families, they, they were having this uh, le lesbian sister, the lesbian OG, the, the girl who wants to be like a boy. So it was more like, they were sharing the trauma I was going through. So I was like, maybe if I go to a place where I don't have relatives, I don't have OBs and OGs, maybe I'll just be there and like integrate. Yeah, though it wasn't the case. It was like very challenging getting here from the language you speak. The moment you, you speak English and you don't speak Swahili, which is the commonly used language. Right. People would be like, oh, where are you coming from? You're coming from Uganda and you are a refugee. You are not here to study. Uh, you're not here to work. You're just a refugee seeking asylum. It's like you have to explain yourself because refugees come from war-torn areas. So <laughs> Uganda is peaceful. Why are you here? So every single day you had to be coming out. With challenges. But we'll focus a little bit more on those in a short time. And Craig? Um, introduce yourself for us too, and, and uh, just briefly, how long you've been here in, uh, in Kenya? 
Hey everyone, um, I'm Craig Paris and I'm the executive director of Rosia. Um, I've been here since 2015. I'm a gay man and growing up in Uganda, um, some things were bound to happen. I was bound to look for love. I was bound to look for sexual pleasure, satisfaction, and I couldn't do it with maybe from the opposite sex. I was only attracted to boys and I'm still attracted to boys only. And to me, it was the right timing because I was coming out of age. I was in the university and I'd gotten to know the gay community in Uganda. And for me, I thought I had found my tribe. I thought I had found, and yes, really, I found people who really look at me, who look like me, people who are like me, people who are attracted to people who are like me. And um, by the time that I came out, by the time that happened, my family got to know, and this is a very staunch Muslim family, and to them, being gay, being queer, uh, loving someone from the same sex is really a no-go zone for them. Um, they just don't want to even mention it. It's such a very, it's, it's, it's such a taboo for them. So like for me, it was the timing and I couldn't suppress my feelings anymore. I couldn't hide it anymore and they got to find out. And one thing led to another and I was lucky. I got to get connected to um LGBTI organizations in Uganda and the, some activists helped me to cross over because my life was by then was very in danger and people were coming after me and all that. And I'm glad that I got to get friends in the LGBTI community in Uganda that helped me when I needed them. And that's how I came to UK. Yeah. And fast forward 2020, I can't go back to Uganda because um, people will kill me, <laughs> literally. And because of my, my sexual orientation, because of who I really I am. And for me, I, I'm thankful that that happened because if it didn't happen, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have come to this self-realization that I am valid and my sexuality is valid and I deserve this and no one can tell me otherwise. Okay, I'm gonna hold you on that thought because we're gonna continue with that shortly yeah. as well. Um, but I want to, uh, to, to also introduce um, uh, Susan Mwende, who's going to join us in a moment. Uh, Susan is a uh, queer feminist who volunteers with the Foundation for LBQ Women uh, uh, Refugees in, uh, in Kenya, and, which is based in Nairobi. Works together closely with you also, Dali, I, I, I understand. And uh, she's a poet and has written something that is, uh, you know, really quite, uh, you know, impactful. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Susan. Hi, my name is Susan Mude. I am delighted to be joining the All Out and Distance Festival today and to have the pleasure to be introducing panel on the LGBT plus refugees with one of my poems. Okay. I watched it and watched it all. I could feel it deep in my bones, deep in my soul, crashing, squeezing, sucking the pain out of my heart, strolling over all my unfelt emotions. I can't take it anymore. They broke out of the cage. Now all they do is linger in my mind, messing up everything, the anxiety, paranoia, hold up. I thought those two were twins, but they never used to attack individually. But right now, I can't even tell what's real from what's a fuss, what's emotional from what's mental, what I should condone from what I should assume. What is happening to me? It's just tap all over my intuition and my sanity. They told me I can never be enough, that I can never have enough masculinity to be a man, not enough femininity to be a woman. They called me a outcast, discriminated me more than I can count. My own people, my own family, my own blood. I broke into pieces, learned to treat me as they did. Hated this forgotten body, shattered, broke down, tried to end this forsaken life until I decided enough is enough. 
I decided to leave all that behind, the mask, the pretense. I chose the person in the mirror, the one who couldn't be masculine or feminine enough, so they seemed. I chose the person who couldn't even sit well in the dress. I chose the person who can't decide whether they are into seats or trance. And as days go by, I live happier, knowing my truth that I chose me. I chose the love. And this goes out to all queers of the Keep choosing you. Keep choosing love. Because you are my chosen family. Happy Pride Month. Wow. Incredible. Incredible words of courage and, and, and conviction. And, uh, you know, it, it really opens up for me a, a, a dialogue with, with each of you that, uh, you know, really begins with what being an asylum seeker um, and, and a refugee really means to you. Um, and, and maybe we can begin with, uh, with you, Dali. Um, you can reflect upon that for us to begin. Thank you. Like, um, first off, even uh, myself, I didn't even know the difference between an asylum seeker and a refugee. You know, until they would, they would tell you that, you know what, we don't recognize you. You are still an asylum seeker. Someone is supposed to make a decision. Someone is supposed to, you have to prove to someone that you are in danger. You know, like, you have to wait for a decision for a particular person to tell you, you know what, you are in danger or you need protection. So before you that you're just an asylum seeker, especially here. And it's challenging because even the authorities recognize refugees, not asylum seekers, but it can take you even up to four months before you are a, an approved refugee. You know, so it feels, uh, as a person for me, it feels like, it makes me feel that resilient. And then it makes me feel Brave, the bravery, just having to choose you and you'll be like, you know what, I'm going to be me and I'm going to go and seek protection. Yeah, and also uh, for me being a, an asylum seeker refugee just means like someone is brave, someone needs help, someone needs to be protected. That's what it is like for me. Craig? Can you tell us also how you feel, uh, you know, um, in the process of, of seeking asylum before you're actually recognized as a refugee? There's a lot of, you know, um, issues that, that uh, you confront. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the instability of, of maintaining yourself as an asylum seeker, not within a refugee status, um, and, and the impact of that, the length of time it takes, et cetera. Um, what would you, in, in your own process, um, in transitioning from an asylum seeker to refugee status, what did that actually represent for you? Uh, thank you. Um... In 2015, when I first arrived, it was a bit easier and we were given more attention, more than today. And when you arrive, when I arrived, I got registered right away and I was taken to the transit center and I waited for financial assistance. Then I was integrated in the community. But right now it's, it's more difficult um, even to get registered. Uh, the first thing they tell you is you're going to be taken to the camp. And for people who can't go to the camp for one reason or the other, you're left with a document that can't be used in, in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it makes you more susceptible to these arbitrary arrests that we are always facing, that uh, harassment and from the authorities and from anyone or from the local people, it can be easier to you and you can be an easy target. 
So for me, um, being given that status of a refugee status, it helps you at least for uh, for a, for a time being that you're here, that at least there is some sort of legality that you're here, but something that you can flash to the authorities or police, and that shows them that you back off for some time. But if you you only have the other document that that is provided to the asylum seekers, um, it's difficult. It's difficult for you, and it it makes you frustrated because each time you try to get it, they always tell you that. Because of policy, we can't expedite this. Because of uh, past laws, we can't do this and this. You're only left with a few options. That's why most people are taken to Kakuma, because they can't just be here and go through the constant harassment. But then again, they can't just be without the proper documentation. So um, you end up going to the camp, and we know what happens in the camp. And for me, I was lucky that because the time I came in, um, we are given time and uh, we were so considered for the urban refugee status. And by the time I got here, I got the document and though I wasn't on the refugee status, the document I had allowed me to be in the, in the urban centers. And I used to go for each and six months. Every after six months, I would go to be renewed, to, for the document to be renewed. But then again, the time increased from six months to eight, to a year, now we can't even tell. It's just that you're just in this position of limbo and because you don't have proper documentation, you're just lost. So for me, it was easier, but I can't speak, I can't say the same for the rest of people who came later on. It must be, it's still very harder for them. Minta, you came um, more recently. Can you speak to us about what experience you have had? arriving here and uh, you, you arrived as an asylum seeker. Uh, thank you, Mark. Well, um, personally, uh, being an, an asylum seeker in Kenya really comprises of so many different things and it comes along with, um, let me say, positive and negative challenges because uh, it's a situation that you're put in that you wouldn't really want to be in in the first place. Um, coming into a country that you're not well versed with, you don't know uh, the whereabouts of different things all together. You don't know how to go about with, uh, how you're going to be able to be welcomed, depending on what your reasons are for getting into the country. Um, and then the biggest thing is, getting into that country and not knowing where exactly you're supposed to go to first and how you are going to be helped out. So it's normally a gamble game, a gambling thing, if I can put it that way. Um, uh, being an asylum seeker in Kenya is, because um, first of all, it comes from way behind that the fact that you left, I left my country because I wasn't safe and I decided to come into Kenya. But however much, Kenya does not also support um, homosexuality and you know, the proposed LGBT different sexual orientations. It still went ahead to be able to uh, accommodate me and welcome me. So I find that as something that is uh, like of an, ad um, an added advantage to me as an asylum seeker. And um, as much as the Kenyan law is against homosexuality, it has been able to at least uh, provide me with a place to stay that I literally do not have to pay for, for example, the Kakuma camp. Uh, this is a country that went ahead to make sure that, well, if you do not have the refugee status and you are not able to be in Nairobi, but being that you are under them and you are seeking for asylum in their country, they were able to like, get you into a place of safety, however much it may not really be safe to the level that you would want as, a, as an individual, but it was able to provide you with a place to stay. And on top of that um, uh, comes different services, they're able to offer us with jobs, they're able to give us a little, a little bit of food every month. And um, we are able to even like access free education where you don't really have to pay for anything. All you just have to do is give their your manifest, yeah, and uh, everything else falls in place. Um, 
uh, but then my also my own understanding also of being um, an asylum seeker is the fact that you get to leave your life behind you get to leave your career behind uh, because personally I'm a journalist by profession but I wasn't able to continue with my profession because I wasn't able to be safe enough in my own country of origin but I had to go into another country and start a new life all over again so you literally get to leave everything about you behind you forget about your goals you forget about your future that you have really um set or come putting in place from the time you go to understand what really life means to you as an individual uh so basically that's it and uh, yeah uh so for um for those that are uh newly um arriving in uh kenya into um uh an asylum seeking process uh, what would be the best advice to offer to uh to someone that's you know just arriving into the country or thinking about coming into the country uh, from elsewhere uh would they would you recommend that they contact an organization like refsia in order to link into um uh supportive services uh, some that may be coming may need health related uh, services. Some may need um, HIV or, you know, uh, testing or, or um, uh, disease management. How do we address those for somebody that's now considering or, uh, in, you know, currently entering or living in the asylum seeking process before getting refugee status? Okay. Uh, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, for such a person, uh, I would, yes, I would recommend them to really uh, to get in touch with Refsia because uh, personally, like um, speaking from experience, Refsia has uh, helped me to some extent, like to a greater extent. It has helped me uh, get to fit into this new life because they get to introduce you to different things. They get to help out with... Um, uh, like just you have just like you have mentioned they get to help you out to like introduce you to different counselors whereby they're even able to put uh to get you to those different services of like getting tested for hiv just like you have mentioned so personally i would recommend someone to get in touch with refsia because i have been under them before and i am still under them and i'm sure i know what they can do and they are able to direct someone um through the right path being an lgbt person and Delia, uh, but then it also comes about to if i'm going to jump to delia for a moment um and and delia you also work with uh you know refugees um you know of, of different languages as well uh french speaking so how how do you deal with this particular issue of somebody that's newly uh you know accessing the uh the asylum seeking process in uh, in in Kenya um, and in need of direction. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first off, I would tell them like to first get to know how it works. Because when you come here, you will find, for example, Dale has been here four years, yeah, and then when you come. You think you're going to live the way that is living, yeah. So, so first of, I introduce them to the community, because here most of us just got the families we are with here, and that's where where all the strength comes from. And then from there we take you through, because for us, for example, the RFCA and other CBOs, we don't have the mandate to do the registrations. And also, if uh, if you don't have the proper registration, um, my hands are tied to really help you out. First, I'll just make sure you get the documentations from the government authorities, that's for us. And from there, that's when I tell you not, if they've given you a Kakuma document, you have to go for an exemption interview so that you can be accepted as an urban refugee or an urban asylum seeker. 
And we also do like uh, community awareness with our peer educators. We come to those areas. We talk about how people are supposed to get the proper documentations. We tell them the referrals, the health services, where to go for what, for legal aid. We also, that's the best, the best thing we do. We give the information out there. Because when you have the information, you can protect yourself. I think that this is really critical in, in, in its message being delivered right now because there are many that are not sure how to navigate this whole process. And knowing that they can link up, that they can contact an organization like REFSIA and other organizations under REFSIA's umbrella in order to be able to access you know, this, uh, this information and you know, how to properly maneuver through and navigate the system I think you know is is critical critical overall to the asylum seeking and refugee experience you know um i want to remind everyone that uh is is uh you know um tuned in on facebook as well as zoom that you can submit questions um and and we're seeing your questions come in in real time some of them are being woven into some of the questions that we're asking now and uh, we'll continue to uh, you know, ask questions through to the, uh, to the end of the, um, uh, of the panel discussion. So please feel free to uh, submit questions uh, for the panelists and uh, we'll do our best to, uh, to get them answered for you. Um, I, I wanna switch uh, to, to another particular uh, topic uh, for a moment and, and, and really to, to take a look at like, you know, the struggles and the challenges and the daily dangers and vulnerabilities that uh, you guys, you know, that you are experiencing um, uh, in the uh, um, LGBT refugee program, um, and what it takes each of you independently to survive and 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 make your way through it. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll jump to uh, to Craig to begin on that. Could you repeat the question, Mark? Uh, the answer uh, my, is that one. What struggles and challenges and daily, da daily dangers are you experiencing um, as a uh, LGBT refugee in Kenya? And what does it take you to survive each day? Yeah, so uh, thank you for that question. But um, I'll answer like a person, an individual, but I also answer like the general LGBT refugee community. As an individual, I'm privileged to be in this position that, uh, and also with the time I've spent here and the experience I've gone through, I'm privileged to know how to go about most situations. And I know where not to go and where to go. And some dangers I can prevent. But for a refugee that has just come in, or an asylum seeker that has just come in, um, First of all, they have that danger of not being uh, in possession with uh, the proper documentation. And that makes you at a higher risk, that you're at a higher risk of being harassed by the police because they will, they will ask you, are you a terrorist? Because here in Kenya, there is a, a culture of people, all foreigners, to be taken mostly for terrorists other than foreigners. So uh, if you don't have proper documentation, there is that hall of problems for you. And for people who have stayed longer, um, the cases, our cases seem to have stalled. And it takes, now, right now, it takes longer than it used to take. Uh, those times in 2014, 15, people used to take six months, eight months to be resettled. But now the longer you take, the more problems you are exposed to and the more challenges you face. And for someone who has been here longer, they've gone through many challenges including uh starvation people really love food and there is a really big problem of food insecurity and housing in, in the urban settings is really very expensive if you don't have someone who helps you if you're not on highest financial assistance or any other program by unit Sierra, it becomes very difficult to sustain yourself here to pay for rent to pay for your medication or to buy food. So it depends on, on where you are, at what level you are in and where you're staying. And also not to forget people who are in Kakuma, they experience a whole lot of difficulties because of their setting. 
Um, so for any refugee or any queer refugee, there is that intersectionality that we have the general problems, but also there is the individual problems that face you according to your situation, according to your time that you spent, and according to the documentation that you have. So for a queer refugee, it's, uh, I, I hate to say this, but it's a bombardment of challenges. Though we are resilient enough and we can, we can manage through with the support. Uh, this is this is why um, outside support is so critical. Yes, absolutely. Support and 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 why that outside support coordinated. Yes, it, it has to be coordinated because if it is not coordinated, uh, there will be duplication. There will be wastage of the limited resources that we have, and also there will be confusion because you will hear something from here and another person is saying this, and for people. Some people get so frustrated easily and they just let it be. They will be like, ah, I have my problems of my own and I don't want to go through this. So it is imperative that we coordinate this. It is imperative that we network all our efforts, that we channel them in the proper way. Because if we don't harness these efforts, then it becomes um, monotonous and becomes wasteful. Um, Minta? Yes, Mark. Can you tell us uh, about struggles and challenges that you experience and daily dangers that uh, you know really um, uh, feed into your vulnerabilities and uh, what it takes you daily to survive living at Kakuma? Oh, thank you so much, Mark, for that. Um, I'm going to answer this um, basing on what I'm really going through in Kakuma because I won't speak for the time that I was in Nairobi because uh, basically the challenges and struggles uh, tend to be different. Well, um, here in Kakuma, uh, the biggest challenge that I face or that we face, because I'll speak as an individual and uh, on behalf of the rest, because in, we normally share, we share most of the struggles and challenges. Uh, first and foremost, we have uh, discrimination which comes through from uh, the, our fellow non-LGBT refugees. Um, first and foremost, they get to know, even before you speak to them, um, our way of dressing is literally different from how they dress. Meanwhile, we all wear the same clothes, but I don't know how they really get to tell that, okay, uh, this one is different and this one is an LGBT. And then... Um, being that we are not well versed with uh, their first language, being uh, Kiswahili, it also really like uh, puts us out, uh, puts us out there in the spotlight, and um, it gets to really put us in the open that we are non-LGBT. Sorry, we are LGBT people, and uh, they have it in their minds that every person that comes from Uganda automatically has to be an LGBT, which is true. But uh, it's so absurd that that is literally what they think of us. So they discriminate us, uh, they discriminate us a lot, which is something that is really um, uh, like physical torture and mental torture. It brings really physical torture and mental torture to you because at the end of the day, you are not even able to go to a particular shop to buy something or to get to uh, withdraw your Bamba Chakula money because you are going to speak to them in English and they'll clearly send you to another show. And then uh, we also face insults and harassment whereby you just be moving or with a fellow girl and someone will just come out of the blue and ask, so who is the man and who is the woman between the two of you? I mean... So these are, so these are, challenges, these are challenges unique to LGBT refugees that aren't to... Um, refugees of the general population. No, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. These are unique challenges to all the LGBT because uh, we are literally out there in the open and they can easily identify us in their own ways. And uh, the usual threats and attacks and then um, earning a living is also something very hard because uh, personally, uh, the very first time I arrived here, I was also like attacked. And uh, it just comes out of the blue whereby someone just comes to you and they're like, you, you're not supposed to be here. And then they have this local word that they use calling us sugars. So it's um, a very hard 
interesting it's it's hard to stay here it's hard to live along with this uh, with our fellow refugees because they literally just throw us out that uh, they just uh, shut us out of their own world and do you find have you here. found have you found any um uh non lgbt refugees that are friendly to lgbt refugees at the camp yeah there are few but uh, if we say out of a hundred, we can uh, come about like five of them or ten of them. But they are there that really don't mind who we are. And if I told you, like in your shell, and you're not really exposing yourself or showing off who you really are, they don't mind us. They are there. Uh, I'm going to just uh, switch to Dali for a moment. Dali, I wanted to ask you, and and with respect to the uh, the. Uh, uh, lesbian community in in Nairobi and the challenges also you and you you experience individually but also as a community itself um, and and those struggles if you could speak to to those for us yeah thank you uh, the first one is uh, the language here Swahili is widely spoken even uh, the government, everything is basically like the information is always in Swahili. And the moment you, you speak, you are profiled. The moment they hear you speak English, you are profiled. You don't even have to have done anything to know that you're coming from here. And already now, like as Ugandans, you've been profiled to be queer. Even if you be like, I'm just going to, the moment you speak. Then the other one is uh, uh, about like the, the policies. Even the, the community we live in is very uh, conservative. So it becomes hard to just even integrate because first of the policies make you a victim. You're, you are already... I think Delhi's um, um, connection froze a little bit. Victimized, for example, during, I'm sorry about, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. yeah so I'm about the policies, the policies already victimized you. Because for example, during the COVID, the government gave out uh, like uh, public funds, like public help. But then as an asylum seeker, you are not there. You haven't been accounted for. They're accounting for their citizens and uh, refugees but they know you are here because they registered you. And then uh, also the other thing, for example, the lesbians with kids, you know, they are, they're being discriminated even in our small community because someone will say, how are you a lesbian and you have a child? And then they put in, in, they're put in a position where you are, you are either supposed to be like, they raped me, like you have to explain why you are queer and you have a child. So even in the community, we are, we are still having that. Uh, and also I, I should say as uh, lesbians, uh, the community itself uh, sometimes feels that for us, we usually pass, you know? Maybe they'll just look at you as a tomboy or if you are a, 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 feminine, a feminine lesbian, People don't think you go through even the em emotional torture or the psychological torture, the mental stress, yeah, because they feel you pass. So no one wants to listen. No one feels you also have needs. Yeah, I should say that also like, uh, for example, I, I should, I want to speak more about the thing of policies. Like uh, here, there is a law that decriminalizes uh, homosexual acts yeah, as unnatural acts. So Correct. that means a policeman is not going to plot to protect okay. you. You see, it's, it's, so you uh, you feel like you are just here because of the refugee act. Yeah, that that's what is protecting you. But you're going to spend four years without being recognized as a refugee because someone is supposed to make that decision. That you know what? Now you are a refugee. You get me. And then also we have a challenge as uh, now like leaders in the queer community, the times have changed. For example, when Craig came, you would register and you would choose to either go to the camp or stay in the urban. Right, right. now it's different. It's hard to even advise a new arrival 
because you don't know what's even happening in the system. Because the first thing you know, people are getting financial aid from a certain agency. And the next thing you hear, it has been gotten off, like it has been cut off. So you tell someone, you know what, when you register in six months, they are going to call you to do the RSD interview. Yeah? That is, that is what is there. That's what is written, but that's not what happens. So when you tell this person, you know what, hold up. In six months, things are going to be okay. It's not going to happen. They're going to spend a year without getting the RSD interviews. So also that one puts like, it's a very big challenge. You don't know what's going on. Yeah. So what would you recommend to someone that is having difficulty making their way through the system because of this? They're experiencing this right now as we speak, or they're looking to come into Kenya. And, and, and we touched on this earlier in the conversation. What would you recommend that they do? Would the best thing for them to do be to contact Refsia and, and speak to somebody and link up with an agency on the ground? Yeah, that would be like the best thing because uh, what happens if you just call someone, they don't know how the system works now. But if you have gone maybe to Refsia and you are a lesbian and they send you to FOBK or they send you to CESO or they send you uh, like maybe to Team No Sleep, there you are going to get the right information. They will tell you to go and register. They will tell you where you get the health services. Yeah, and then I would tell them to be very patient and resilient. We can go through this. Yeah, and I also want to tell them that uh, as refs here, we are also refugees. We are also asylum seekers. So we need to work with them. We need to work with them. They should contact knowing that we are also trying to make life better for the entire community. Yeah. I'd like to, um, you know, touch on um, how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted your resettlements and, and the resettlements in the community itself and, 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 and what you see happening, you know, in uh, the refugee program on account of the pandemic. And maybe we can start with, uh, with, with Craig to set uh, a little bit of the context for it, you know, uh, from the um, uh, agency's perspective. Uh, when, the, the, uh, when the pandemic uh, broke out uh, around March here in Kenya, and everywhere else around the world, they suspended the um, operations on UNHCR offices and other partners and IOM and all. But uh, fast forward to, the, to yesterday, uh, there was a statement from IOM and UNHCR, and it showed that there was resumption of all operations and there will be resettlements. It could be slow because other countries haven't opened and there are some restrictions with travel and flights. But other than that, um, the cases have resumed and they are working on them. It's just a matter of time to be called and for your appointment and interview. And though there is still COVID, but they've made some arrangements how we are going to go about it in a better way, in a safer way. Uh, the um, recommendations made by IOM and UNHCR when you're going for your interviews, what you have to take, uh, and what you will find there as preventive measures. And that is all in place to resume everything to, to continue supporting. But thank uh, you. Yes, yes, yes. And right now, I, I've, I've heard of people who have been called, and one of our board members is, is soon going to be resettled, and I'm happy for that. And it's one of the manifestations that it has resumed, the cases have resumed to be worked on. That's, that's fantastic. Um, Delhi, can you tell us what you're doing to celebrate Pride this year? You should say like, today, last year, we, we won some certificates at the refugee marathon. We had a, a refugee marathon. So today I woke up and I'm like, I had the same last year, <laughs> we were somewhere on the refugee day, and then, yeah, 
and today I, I we had some friends over here and uh we just had a meal and here we are that's great um, happy though. yeah and i also got a, a, a gift of this plug <laughs> from a friend so yeah pride has been cool for me beautiful and also Minta, my, how's pride being celebrated for you oh uh, thank you mark um pride has been a great day for me and uh, my little family back in Kakuma. Uh, just like Delhi celebrated uh, theirs, we invited a few friends over and uh, we shared a meal. Yeah, got to play games. Um, we got to play cards. We got to share different stories. We got to laugh. So it was literally a day of our little fun in our own safe space because we couldn't really literally go out there and march and, you know, be proud of who we were, like lift our flags out. No, we weren't able to do that. But the little that we were able to do today was just share a meal together and get to link up, catch up, you know, and it was really fun. Yeah. Um, Craig, can you tell us what is the most effective way? Uh, and it's a question that's being asked now. Uh, a couple of people have been asking um, this morning what the most effective way for those in the West to help support the refugee program in, uh, in uh, Kenya. And, you know, currently we have food insecurity, both in Nairobi and, uh, and, and at Kakuma. Um, uh, gratefully, um, um, uh, All Out, uh, you know, um, uh, rolled out a, a, a fundraising campaign that raised uh, you know, funds for a humanitarian relief program for April, May, and June that helped, you know, tremendously. And we're hoping to, you know, continue that. But what is the most effective, best way for those in the West to, uh, to support the refugee program? For the... Uh, there, are two, there are two or three ways or the most effective ways to help this situation. And the first one is to donate, actually beg and cry out to everyone else to donate to these programs, especially to organizations that reach out to help. All Out has been doing a very big uh, job helping us to get food for Kakuma and also um, empowering the, the administration uh, here in, at RFCA. But Allied, ORAM, uh, African Human Rights Coalition and other uh, organizations, WUHAI has been doing a very good job uh, with donating and funding these programs. But this is what happens when you donate. When you donate, uh, the money goes directly to help refugees with providing food. Like for now, uh, people are isolated, they need food. Uh, there's no financial assistance from us right now. Uh, in the camp, it's really hard also. So right now, if you donate, the food goes directly to the CBOs that are going to buy food. And it's not only RFG Coalition that is doing it, but uh, I see so many other people that are coming up. and. We need this, but we need it to be really well coordinated. And I thank God that Refugee Coalition has this structure that is well connected. You can trace your donations and your support, your input, however it you avoids, want. It avoids duplication or wastage yes, of absolutely. Personal. Avoidance to duplication and fraud and bad practices. So for us, we have systems that are in place that can help uh, have, because there is, some people who are willing to, to donate, but they don't have the confidence. There is a constant bombardment of information and requests and GoFundMe pages and everywhere. So they don't know what, what to trust, where to put their money. So I thank the system that we have at Refugee Coalition and all the partners that we have been working with, with All Out. And if you have something, you can donate directly to All Out. We have uh, a fund that is running that is going to cater for refugees in Kakuma and also queer refugees in Nairobi. But we're also working with other partners like Light. They also have a fundraiser. We've been fundraising funds with Oram, but all this is going to come and coordinated and it's going to go through the right channels. So that is one of the ways to help the, the situation. The second is also to help with the policy makers. We need to lobby them. We need to, we need to write to them. We need to write to UNHCR because if they don't hear from anyone else, if they don't hear from us, they won't know what is happening. 
and because of the red tapes and officers being far away from the grassroots, it's harder for them to even feel the pain that we go through or the pain that someone in the camp is going through. So for the policymakers, we need to write to them, we need to remind them, because some of them become lazy on their job and they become incompetent. And I'm sorry to say if it's hard, but that is what I see. And we need to remind them constantly that actually you're supposed to be doing this. Actually, people's lives are at stake and you could do this. Instead of you sitting there and enjoying your place and everything, you could be doing this to, to serve this situation, to better this. And like we say, and everyone else around the world is preaching that right now in the world, it's not my problem, it's everyone's problem. Because if you say it's only my problem, it will catch up to you eventually. So the, the other second way is, for the policymakers to be reminded to do policies that help with the programs of queer refugees. Then the third is more of a human basis, is to talk to these refugees, talk to us, we don't bite. I know we constantly beg for, for food, for help, for money, and it's rude sometimes, it's so impolite, but sometimes we are left with no other tools. And if you don't talk to someone, if you don't have social media, no one will know, no one will care, and you'll die alone. So for us, the third place is just to talk to us. Let's have that human connection, human to human, man to man, trans to trans. It really helps us to know that um, there is some human resource we can tap in, there is friendship and network and community that we can make. I think the network and the community is, is one of the most uh, critical parts of it. And it really brings me to, you know, um, you know a, a part that I, I think is, uh, you know, encouraging and positive to all of this. The, um, and, and, and each of you, and we only have a few minutes left, uh, but maybe each of you can give like some closing thoughts on, you know, encouraging and positive outcomes and experiences that this is all building even in the relationships and the networking at a global level, and certainly this year marks a, a new step in, in, in global connectedness within the LGBT community as well, um, and, 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 and how that extends outward. But maybe we can start with Minta for a moment, just some closing thoughts on encouraging experiences or um, uh, elements within all of this for you. Minta? Deli, did you hear my question? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I should say, like, uh, from even what we are having now, I feel I've been hard. I've been hard, but I've been seen. And uh, I will tell my fellow queer asylum seekers and refugees to hang in there and i want them to show up for each other let's show up for each other that's the only way we can change these policies the only way we can survive through this yeah and i should say we love them if you're queer and you are there you are loved you are seen and you are worthy just keep being yourself minta can you hear uh yes mark i can i can hear you did I miss um, out? Yeah, you can you can continue on. Oh, it's okay. What your what your uh, um, positive, encouraging um, um, experiences or, or 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 feelings are, you know, regarding the uh, you know areas that uh, that are represented inside of this experience for you. Uh, well, basically, as um, I will speak as an individual and uh, as the LGBT community at large uh, here back here in Kakuma. Well, first of first and foremost, uh, I would like to just give a piece of advice. Uh, it would be much better for us to be united uh, than uh, separated. Yeah, uh, it is much better when we face these challenges together as a community other than as individuals, because uh, um, of late it seems like the LGBT community also seems to be having issues with each other due to different personal reasons and uh, 
basically because so and so is like this, so and so is like this, so they feel at the end of the day they need to like no kids, which is not something right because we are against um, a very dis a big discriminative uh, world out there. Very many people that do not really like the type of people, the kind of people that we are. So I would really advise that we stick together for us to be able to overcome all this. And then um, another thing is uh, um, for us to be able to also live as LGBT people, it would be much better for us to create and identify LGBT friendly people in order for us to be able to, you know, like uh, be able to get the services um, that we need in order to avoid being really isolated and all that. And um, uh, one last thing that I would really want to say is we, we shouldn't lose hope. We shouldn't lose faith and we shouldn't hate who we are because this is who we are. Um, we, we didn't choose this life. This is how we were brought up. This is what we feel we need to be. So we shouldn't be ashamed of who we are. And if given that opportunity to be to show off who you are proudly do it if you're able to you know because personally i would give anything to be out there and move you know along the streets and holding hands with my girlfriend and really doing whatever i feel i need to do so if you have the chance to do that please make use of it and above all who would all to all the LGBT community out there, those that are listening in, those that have been able to join us live, um, we love you so much from back here in Kakuma. And yeah, thank you so much for each and everything. I would like to also thank the different organizations that have been there for us. Um, RevCR, All Out, um, H HRC, thank you so, so, so much for the support that you have rendered to us back here. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Minta. Craig, your closing remarks and uh, your feelings on this subject? Yeah, first of all, I want to say happy Refugee Day again to everyone else. And I want to commend every supporter in their form. I want to very, very much say thank you to All Out, to Matt Beard, he's a really great man. I appreciate his support and his service to the community. To you, Mark, thank you very much. You've been a dear friend. and. Um, Allied, um, HHRC, Mel, and everyone else, and whoever supports us in their capacity, really, it's, it's something. And for our community, and from my experience, I feel it's something big, something I never even had in Uganda. So that is very much taken in, in stride for us, and we love it so much. And I also want to encourage my fellow refugees that uh, all is not lost, though we are going through a lot and all. In Kakuma, we are not really forgetting what is really happening in Kakuma. I don't really sleep because of what is happening in Kakuma. And I want to remind everyone there and here in Nairobi that we are one, we are in this together. People are coming out for us to show us that they care and we should take that, we should appreciate that. And to the world, we are very we are in a very crucial moment that like i said like one one person's problem or a humanitarian problem um needs us to come up also don't sleep on that don't just sleep knowing that ah for you you're comfortable in your duvet and everywhere else uh just be you more human enough <laughs> and it's not like anyway just be more human enough love more regard more uh, feel more empathy for the next person. You never know what will happen. I never knew how I would get here and if I would get here, but here I am. And it helped me to see things from a different lens. And uh, more, I can say I'm more of a human, more of a, a good person because of the experience, because of this lived experience. And I want to thank God for that. And I want to thank every friend who is out there supporting my friends, my workmates, my colleagues. Uh, everyone else, um, for me, pride, I'm going to spend a refugee day with, with myself. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm keeping safe from COVID and all. But my heart is all out to everyone out there. Well, I, I can honestly say that we make every day refugee day. And, uh, you know, from my heart uh, to yours, Craig, you know.
And uh, I'm grateful that I have someone together like you to work with, uh, you know, every day in the middle of the hours of, uh, you know, on the West, as we're addressing issues, you know, on the ground there. And, uh, you know, I think in closing, it's important that everyone know that uh, REFSIA has an active fundraising campaign currently with All Out, uh, together with African Human Rights Coalition, um, in order for us to continue the, uh, the uh, humanitarian relief that we have been providing at Kakuma. Um, and uh, the information for that, I believe, is also going to be available, you know, in this uh, um, a forum at the end of the uh, at panel discussion. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and uh, encourage you, if you can, uh, next week uh, between June 23rd and 25th to uh, join uh, also in um, All Out's Undistanced Festival as it continues. Uh, you can RSVP uh, for um, the upcoming virtual events on their website. And again, we're grateful to, uh, to All Out, Matt Beard, and uh, the entire All Out team, uh, Yuri and Metius, who uh, you can't see but are working this behind the scenes, and everyone else in to our refugee brothers and sisters. We love you. Thank you. We love you too. <laughs> we love you too, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. All right. Take care. <laughs>